Hi, I'm Paul Slovak. I'm an executive editor at Viking. Always a great pleasure to be with librarians. You do so much to help us bring our books into the world. There couldn't be a more thrilling thing for a writer, not to mention for his publisher, than to see what happened when Rules of Civility, the debut novel of Amor Tolls, was published in 2011. Pretty much everyone who read it fell immediately and deeply in love with it, starting with our sales reps, then booksellers, then critics who couldn't stop talking about the beautiful, luminous writing, the sharp observations, the terrifically drawn characters, and the sure-handed evocation of Manhattan in the late 1930s. I bet a lot of you in the room probably read it. The novel was a huge hit with readers, too. It became a bestseller in hardcover and paperback. Such success can put a lot of pressure on a writer, but I'm here to tell you that Amor has more than fulfilled the promise shown in this first work with his new novel, A Gentleman in Moscow, which Viking will publish this coming September. It is, I believe, a novel that will only further cement his reputation as a transporting storyteller and a writer of incredible richness, sophistication, and elegance. It's a captivity novel of an unusual sort. As it opens in 1922, a Russian count in his early 30s has been deemed by a Bolshevik tribunal to be an unrepentant aristocrat and is placed under house arrest and ordered to spend the rest of his life in a small attic room in a luxury hotel in Moscow called the Metropole as some of the most tumultuous decades in Russian history unfold. The Count is a marvelous creation, a larger-than-life character, and how he adapts to and is transformed by his reduced circumstances makes for a completely memorable and lively tale. Readers will find here many of the elements that they liked about rules, not least a more singular voice, his flawless command of atmosphere, and a bright and varied cast of characters, but in the context of a whole new world. That's what makes this novel so exciting to me, that Amor is painting on an entirely new canvas. I think Amor will admit that when he first started thinking about this novel, he was a bit daunted by the idea of writing a book in which his main character, not to mention his readers, would be trapped in a building in a foreign city for over 30 years. But in the end, it proved a great adventure for him, and here he is to tell you more about it. Thank you. Um, I, I, I want to start by saying it's, it's uh, a very humbling experience to get up and speak after the, these uh, three speakers. It makes me want to go home before I get started. <laughs> but here I am. Uh, no, no escape. Um, as Paul says, my, my new novel, uh, A Gentleman in Moscow, it really opens with a 30-year-old aristocrat being sentenced to house arrest in a luxury hotel uh, for 30 years. And, uh, and, I, and I, Paul's right, I did feel anxious as I got started because I was trapping myself, the, my characters, and ultimately my readers uh, in this building. Um, but as the, the process unfolded, it, what it really became about for me is, is a book about purpose. Uh, being trapped in this, this building in this extraordinary time, the individual is forced to figure out uh, what, might, what life might mean under those circumstances. And the book you go through sort of a series of waves of purpose, but, but two of the critical ones are that uh, having become frustrated in his early years in the hotel, feeling a little claustrophobic and, and uh, aimless, um, he approaches the maitre d' in the fancy restaurant in the hotel and he asks him to be a waiter, to become a waiter. Now, as it turns out, uh, because the count was raised uh, in, uh, with knowledge of cuisine, wine, etiquette, uh, languages, He's the perfect waiter. So you have this irony that in the midst of Bolshevik Russia, this aristocrat becomes the head waiter in the best restaurant and sort of the sought after waiter for the new leadership in society at the time. Now secondly, what happens to him is that uh, when he's first in the hotel, there's a young girl who lives in the hotel, the daughter of a Bolshevik, and uh, she's sort of an Eloise of the Park Plaza type, very precocious, and she befriends him. And many years go by, in 1938, when she's in her late 20s, uh, she shows up at the hotel again. And uh, she explains to the Count, having sought him out, that uh, her husband is being sent to Siberia. And she intends to go with him. Um, but before she gets settled there, following him out there, uh, she needs someone to watch over her daughter. She has no one else to turn to, so she asks him if he'll do so. And he agrees to. And she says that she'll be back in a month for her daughter. And she never returns. So suddenly, 
at the age of 50 as the head waiter in this fancy restaurant under house arrest in this hotel, he becomes the father of a five-year-old girl, which opens up obviously a whole new arena of what purpose might mean in someone's life. Um, now, you know, wh wh where did this come from? Uh, you know, why, what, what is this preposterous notion of this you know, person trapped in this hotel? Where do I start? Well, it comes back, uh, it starts really with the, the fact that for 20 years I was in the investment field, as some of you know, and uh, in my role, in my firm, I would spend a week uh, at a time in hotels around the world. Uh, I spent a week in a hotel in San Francisco and then in Los Angeles and uh, then in uh, London. Um, and one year I was arriving at my hotel in Geneva and for the 10th time, 10th year in a row, and I walk into the lobby and I actually recognize some, some of the weary figures who are kind of sitting there in the lobby. And I thought to myself, you know, this, this is a nice hotel but can you imagine having to spend your life in it? My God, you know. So I go upstairs and I thought, you know, well, that's kind of an interesting question. You know, what would life be like if you were trapped in a luxury hotel for the rest of your life? And immediately uh, it occurred to me that it, it had to take place in Russia uh, where house arrest was, uh, you know, a factor since the times of the czars. So that's what kind of got me started. And in, in the following week, I was in, literally in a hotel in Paris, and I sketched out the outline for the entire book. And this was back in 2009. Now, four years later, uh, I, rules of civility had come out. I quit my job. Um, that's the, the blue jeans and the beard. Um, <laughs> but uh, I quit my job and started the novel. Um, but there, there's a different spark uh, that was kind of further back in time at the heart of the, of the book. Um, and that actually goes all the way back to the late 80s. At the time, I was a graduate student at Stanford, and I had the great fortune of being hired when I arrived as the assistant to the curator of English and American literature in the Stanford libraries. Um, so I spent my life uh, working for him, doing paperwork, some research, taking books out of the stacks, putting books back in the stacks, um, and that was kind of my second home for a couple of years while I was there in California. And one afternoon, uh, I was deep in the stacks. Probably I was supposed to be doing something else, to be honest. But there I was, and I was going through a collection of Chekhov's letters. And at the back of this collection, very far in the back, is a letter that uh, Anton Chekhov wrote to his sister uh, from Berlin in 1904. And he's writing to her from Berlin because he's been very ill, and he's gone there uh, to recuperate. And in the course of this letter, what he explains to his sister is that the trip has been a, a great success, that Berlin is, is fantastic, that the hotel is fabulous, that the food is delicious. And he says, in fact, the bread in Berlin is so amazing that those from Russia who have never traveled to Berlin have no idea of how good bread can be. Um, now, at the bottom of this letter, there's six footnotes in this edition. And the second footnote explains that when the letters of Chekhov were first collected in Russia, which was during the Soviet era, the sentence in which he celebrates the bread from Berlin was expurgated, it was removed from the letter. And this footnote, it, it sparked for me a fascination uh, in Russia that has gone on ever since. And the reason why is because, kind of for two things. The first is that uh, that little notion for me, the first thing that footnote kind of told me or gave me a glimpse into is that in Russia, the, the Soviet government, uh, there was an apparatus that was so large in scale, so intricate, and so obsessive that it could actually root out this little sentence, this offending sentence, and have it removed. And you think about that for the moment because you're talking about thousands and thousands of books being published every year. And this one, which runs about 500 pages long, the letter is the 200th letter. It's on about the 480th page. And there is a sentence right in the middle of the letter, and somebody found it and plucked it out. Um, so that's sort of factor one. I was like, that's pretty impressive uh, in its own kind of chilling way. Um, but the second thing that sort of occurred to me was really I, I got sort of a sense of elation 
from this footnote, paradoxically. And, and the sense of elation stems from the fact that uh, I thought that the footnote was evidence that here was a country that had one of the most extraordinary respect, had the most extraordinary respect for the power of the written word. Because to go through so much effort <laughs> to remove that sentence, it's only because they believed so deeply that the power of a single sentence could undermine an entire government. Right? So that's why they did it. So on the one hand, you had this kind of complex structure of a government that was willing to monitor these things. But on the other hand, you had this spirit of belief, even at the top, that the power of the word could change the future, uh, uh, even against incredible odds. Um, so this also, obviously, uh, led me back to Russia. Um, excuse me for a second. So I Xeroxed this letter. Uh, and I put it, brought it home, I put it in my files, you know, this back in the late 80s, and there it stayed for about 25 years. And I began, when I began to write this novel, suddenly in the back of my mind, that letter came back to the forefront. So I pulled it out, and sure enough, within a matter of days, it had weaseled its way into the narrative. Um, suddenly, uh, written into the story, uh, the Count's oldest friend, who kind of already was a character uh, in the book, it was a dedicated communist, um, but also a dedicated uh, uh, literary professor and editor. Um, in the world of the novel, he becomes the editor who is instructed, who is editing the, the Chekhov letters, and is instructed to remove the offending sentence. And he, like so many Russians over the course of the century, is faced with the, de the decision on the spot of whether to compromise his integrity in this little teeny way, removing this innocuous sentence, or to draw a line and refuse to do so, risking incredible consequences. And so that finds its way into the book from this letter. Um, now, I think for the people in this room, the, the thing that I think is most interesting about this, this little anecdote is that when I had gone in to the stacks that day, I was not actually looking for Chekhov's letters. I was actually looking uh, for the collected short stories of Chekhov. Um, but as, as you all know, uh, the great thing about a stacks, about being in a library, is that you're, you're winding your way through the shelves, you're getting kind of honing in on your prey, as it were, and you get to the point where you're running your fingers along the bindings of the book, and inevitably, as you're almost there, getting to the book you're seeking, something else is going to catch your eye. And that is what you can pull down, flip open, and there can be this little thing, this little item, which has great influence on you and your thought process, your life, the events that follow. And I think that many people would say, if they were asked to define a library, would say, well, that's where you go to get a book that you want. But I think that's not quite right. I think that a library is the place you go to get the book that you don't know you want. And I, I want, to be, want to thank you all, uh, in closing, for being stewards of that amazing kingdom of happy accidents. Thank you.